Welcome to Summit's Online Encounter. Our mission is to provide locations where people like you can have life-changing experiences with God. This is one of those locations. We also gather each week as a church in the heart of St. Paul. As disciples of Christ, we are doing our best to be on mission, deliver hope, and champion this city. At any point in your journey, if you want to take the next steps, or you just want to stay in the loop with everything going on at Summit, just grab your phone and simply text the phrase, Be Known, to 651-360-2908. We'll send you a short form. Please complete it so that you can be known in our Summit family. One of the ways to grow your faith is through worship. Worship with our lives in serving and worshiping Jesus with a song. We have pre-recorded some music in our sanctuary to create a place for you to worship with us virtually. So focus in, give way to the space needed, and invest some time in worshiping Jesus. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me. I'm anointed to bring hope. The promise fulfilled in moment. We're still watching it unfold. There's good news for the captive, a proclamation for every soul. There's liberty for the broken, an invitation to be made to bring hope the promise fulfilled in moment we're still watching it unfold there's good news for the captain a proclamation for every soul this liberty is for the broken an invitation to be made
One of the rhythms that's important to following Jesus is studying scripture. As we study the Bible, we can have hope, find guidance, be corrected, and receive truth into our lives. Let's open God's word and hear this week's message. All right, let's get started because this is an amazing journey we are on in the book of Daniel. We covered chapter one last week. This week we're going to get through chapter two of the book of Daniel. If you want to read ahead, I think you get the idea of what's happening. Uh, Make sure that if you do not uh, catch a message and you want to catch up in this series or in any series, we've got this thing called uh, podcast. Uh, Some of you may know what this is. Some of you may not know what this is. Uh, it's on the internet. If you, we just got that too. Um, I hope you're getting the joke here. It's called Summit Life, Summit Church, Life in the Valley, Life in the Valley, the the podcast of the people of Summit Church, and it prepares us for life in the valley because nobody lives on a dang mountaintop. And so make sure that you get that podcast on where you ever listen to podcasts, and it'll just send you the new message. If you want to go to our YouTube or or our, um, our website, you can go to the media page and you can catch up on a, on a message. Just don't miss, if you really want to go through this book with us, just don't miss a week and pick up at, you know, when we get to Daniel 7 and 11 or chapter 9 and you haven't done 1, 2, or 3, you might as well not come to church. <laughs> because it's like trying to do calculus if you've never done algebra. It's just there's so much there that has to be laid in foundation and so... Don't miss it. Uh, Subscribe to that podcast. Smash that like button. Give us a thumbs up. Hit the notification bell. Okay, moving on. I'll give you a recap, though. Chapter one, we, you need to know we're we're becoming more like Babylon. Uh, We are becoming more like Babylon than any other time in our history uh, as a country. We will have people, and we do have people, in power that do not fear or revere, yura is the Hebrew word, that do not fear or revere God. You're going to have that in Babylon. God is sovereign then and there. He's sovereign here and now. Don't forget that. Nebuchadnezzar thought he was a pawn or thought he was strong, but he was really a what? A pawn. God gave them over to them. God's in control. Uh, You will stay in captivity if you eat and drink and think like a captive. You're going to stay in captivity if you eat, drink, and think like uh, like a captive. What does that mean? If you partake of the king's food, of the, the Babylonian production, I'm letting you know that it's like that frog in boiling water. It just sort of starts to leach in. Compromise after compromise, you basically become what you're called to be salt and light too. We've got to be careful what we consume. The enemy is trying to rename. We talked about this. The enemy is trying to rename blank, just like he renamed people, Nebuchadnezzar did. The enemy is trying to rename all kinds of things. We've got to consume things that bring us life. And I just want you all to know this, that God has you here at Summit in Babylon for a reason. Just like Daniel has or was divinely set up, I'm convinced it's a divine setup. You're here for a reason. You're here for a purpose. Stop guessing. You need truth, mission, and people, and we're doing that here in the 55105. You have been divinely set up. You can run, but you can't hide. God's got you here. He's directed you here. You are here for a reason. Why are you laughing, Tracy? Yeah, because I'll come after you. (laughs) Chapter 2. Let's get there. God, we pray as we just look at this prophet and we move towards his prophecies, Lord, that we would look at this through the lens of the cross, that you give us the right interpretation and application to our lives. Thank you for speaking to Daniel, and we thank you for speaking to us. In Jesus' name, amen. Nebuchadnezzar has a dream in the second year of the reign of Nebuchadnezzar, verse 1, chapter 2 of the book of Daniel. Nebuchadnezzar had dreams. His spirit was trouble and his sleep left him. Now I could just pause right there because I have kids. 
And I'm going to be honest with you. You might as well just call me Nebuchadnezzar. There are times when all three of my kids, when they were little, would end up in my room, in my bed. Just on a random Tuesday night. My sleep has left me many times. How many of you have ever had a baby, a granddaughter, somebody keeping you up at night? A dog. A puppy. You know, I got a text message from a friend uh, the other week, Katie Dean, and she said to me, um, hey, my neighbor's got these puppies, uh, these little puppies for sale. Do you want one? And I was like, I actually want sleep more than I want a puppy. <laughs> Nebuchadnezzar has got this insomnia that's coming over him. His spirit's troubled, and he's dreaming. Now, number one, you need to know something about dreams, that God created the ability for us all to dream. It's hardwired into who you are. Just like you breathing. Okay, everybody take a breath. Okay, let it out slow. Okay, give the person behind you a mint. (laughs) But God made you with that ability to breathe. And he's also given your body the ability to dream. 90 minutes after you fall asleep, you go into what's called a REM stage. Not REM the band, but REM stage. Some of you don't get that joke because you didn't listen to pop music in the early 90s, but some of you did. Every 90 minutes or so, you go into another REM cycle and you pick up another dream. It's interesting as you look at it, it sort of loops, and then you can sometimes pick up where you're left off, and sometimes it's a brand new dream, and sometimes you get some weird dreams. And then you call me and you're like, Pastor, what, what does this mean? And each one gets longer as you dream. That's why when you wake up out of that REM cycle that was just last, you can remember a lot of that dream because that's generally, statistically, the longest one you'll have. And it just happened, so your body's still firing. Your cortex is stimulated, and then really what you need to know is dreams happen. God made that hardwired in you, just like breathing. You have that ability. Now, in this case, in the book of Daniel, and in other cases, not all cases, God can create specific specific outcomes within the ability to dream. That's something that we all have to acknowledge. And if you don't agree with me, that's okay. I would lean that if God created the ability for you to breathe, then just like Colossians chapter 2 says, he can continue to give that ability to you. If he created the, the ability to dream, then God could use that ability to speak to you. It's not a huge leap, but sometimes we start to think that that human response in our biological makeup is somehow, somehow adverse or not subject to the one that made it. I don't live my life that way. God has created that ability to dream. He can use, create specific outcomes within that dream. So all dreams, I'll say this, the ability are essentially created by God. But not all dreams are directed by God. I want you to really grab a hold of that. All dreams essentially are created by God. But not all dreams are directed by God. Sometimes your flesh is directing a dream. Sometimes you, you, you've been fasting for a long time and you, you drove by a big pizza place and you smelled it and you looked in the window and you, you went the other way and then you dreamed that night about pizza. The same is true for pornography. It's just a different word. Sometimes our flesh conjures up things that it wants and it revisits us later. Now, I cannot make a biblical case that there's a specific teaching where Satan is directing or or a teaching on dreams and demons being specific to him pulling the strings. I can make a case that we can be definitely oppressed that there's one that wants to destroy you. 
So what do we do with our dreams? What do we do with the things that we wake up and we go, what the heck does that mean? I am so confused right now. Does that mean I'm supposed to move? Does that mean I'm supposed to sell my, does that mean I'm supposed to take the, should I go over the, I was wondering this question and then I had a dream about banana leaves. Pastor, you tell me this stuff. You talk to me like, like my name's Daniel and you want me to weave this in, like to make sense of it. And you know, I have three gifts. Top three spiritual gifts are our mercy, wisdom, and discernment. So generally God has allowed me to help you navigate that, but I want you to know that not all dreams are directed by God. Some are directed by the flesh, and I would argue that some could be influenced by the work of the enemy. So what do we do? Number one, if you've ever had a weird dream, truth and time go hand in hand. Give it time. Okay? Ecclesiastes 3, 1 through 8. In everything there is a season, in everything there's a time, just give it time. Because if God is really speaking to you, guess what? He is not going to shut up. You're going to have that dream again and again and again and again. And you're, it's going to be something of a cadence that you will eventually pay attention to. So just give it some time. Let it simmer. Sometimes, church, we've got to be, um, let me just say it this way. We've got to stop being, uh, you know, prophetic microwaves. Like, we've got to stop living in the fast and easy microwave, like, oh, God gave me a dream. Bup, this is what it is. Boom, 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 and we rattle off. We've we got to, like, be really careful with the gifts that God's given to equip the church. And when we start talking about that, we love to, like, just make a, a knee-jerk reaction on a, on a microwave style of, of like you could say prophecy or a dream or a vision or something we can't explain. Don't microwave that moment. Be a prophetic crock pot. Let it simmer. Put it in there. Turn it on low, maybe even warm. Come back in a week. Just let it sit. It's okay. Generally speaking, God is not in a hurry and he's not bowing to your timeline. So just give it some time. Test the spirits, John, 1 John 4, 1. Beloved, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits to see if they're from God. For there's many false prophets that have gone out into the world. 1 Thessalonians 5, 20. Do not despise, or, uh, do not, uh, despise prophecies, but test everything and hold fast as what is good. Just test it. Just give it some time. Ask some of the Samuels in your life. Put it through the filter of the word of God. Like sometimes God will give you, you think God gave you a dream and it directly contra, you know, like, like contradicts what he said. I'm telling you, that's not God's dream for you. What God is saying in a dream will never contradict what he said in his word. So test those spirits. Put it through that. Number uh, three, trust your spiritual authority. Trust your spiritual authority. Guess who that is? Guess who that is? Guess who your spiritual authority is? Sure. Guess who God has asked to be your spiritual authority? Sure. But guess who has to show up in your life and talk to you about these things in his office? Me. Me. Yes, the Holy Spirit. Yes, Jesus, thank you for the answers. Your spiritual authority, that's something that God has asked me to be. I'm in charge of your soul. I don't hold that lightly. I don't walk with that without trepidation, fear and trembling. That's a big responsibility. And I got to trust the Holy Spirit to direct those moments. But sometimes, I'm just telling you, can I just tell you something real quick? Summit Church, listen to me. Some of you got to figure out if I'm the pastor here or if I'm your pastor I'm just saying that out loud in the atmosphere here. You have to figure out if I'm the pastor at Summit Church or I'm actually your pastor. Because if I'm really your shepherd, then let's just take a step towards trusting each other. Because can I tell you something? All of you, listen to me, look at me in the face. I don't trust you either. I don't trust you either. 
So what are we going to do? We're going to sit around and wait till we, each other just magically trust each other, or we can start to walk in love, in spirit, in truth, and build the trust like credit over time. But we got to make a decision that we're in community with one another and our opinion in each other's lives matter. And I'm not saying, but I am saying, if I am the pastor at Summit Church and not your pastor, then don't ask to meet with me. Because I want to give you what the Word of God says, not my opinion. I want to give you what the Holy Spirit is revealing to me and to others of I want to commit it to prayer and fast and pray with you about it. But at the end of the day, if you don't trust me and I don't trust you and we don't move forward together, sometimes we can't make sense of the things that God's calling us to do. So trust your shepherd, your spiritual authority. That isn't me, you know, setting me up here. Zechariah 10, 2. The household of little gods utter nonsense and the diviners see lies. They tell false dreams and give empty consolation. Therefore, people wander like sheep. They're afflicted for the lack of a shepherd. And I sat in the back right where you are, Carlos, when this church was 34 people. And I came back one Sunday. That's how many people were here. Ask Brandon. 39 if you count Clarence. 42 if you count one of the babies that were here. Okay, let's just get a little dose of, of reality here. And I came back after being your bridge pastor, stepping away and seeing what God was doing and what he was doing in me. And I sat over there and the Holy Spirit just spoke to me as you were all scattered across this room. They're like sheep without a shepherd, scattered and afraid. I'm not here because I chose this. I'm here because God has called me to this. I don't take a salary. I work here harder than anybody. I'm here because I'm doing it under the Lord. And if you don't trust me at this point, you're never going to trust me. So decide whether I'm your pastor or I'm the pastor of this church. Does that make sense? I want you in my life. I want you to speak into it. I have things I can learn from you. And I guarantee you, you can learn things from me. I want to be careful with this. Because there's a word that shows up when we start talking about this. And it's spiritual manipulation. People can use their power to lord over others versus use their power to get under others and to wash their feet. If you look at my life and you look at my tenure or my time here with you, I pray that you don't see Eric on this pedestal. I say you, you see Eric with a towel. So if you're wondering if your dreams are directed by God or they're just some crazy dream in the flesh or of the enemy, give it some time, be a crock pot, test the spirits, and trust your spiritual authority in your life. That's the Holy Spirit, that's the Word of God, and that's your shepherd. Verse 2 of the book of Daniel chapter 2. That was verse 1. We're going to be here a while. Then the king commanded that the magicians and the enchanters and the sorcerers and the Chaldeans be summoned to tell the king his dream. So they came and stood before the king, and the king said to them, I had a dream, and my spirit's troubled. I want to know what this is. Then the Chaldeans said to the king in Aramaic, remember the interesting structure of this book. We talked about the different languages used. Uh, that's from our first message but they actually speak in Aramaic. O king, live forever. Tell your servants the dream and we'll show you the interpretation. So you tell me the dream and we'll interpret for you. That's not what the king wanted. He said, I want to know the dream and the interpretation. And the magicians and the sorcerers, the Chaldeans, they're like, tell us the dream and then we'll tell you. You could make up any story you want to make up. The answer could be anything. It could be just pulled out of thin air. The king answered and said to the Chaldeans, the word for me is firm. If you do not make known the dream and its interpretation, you shall be torn limb from limb. Sheesh. <laughs> now, listen, if you do come into my office to trust your spiritual authority, do not use that line with me. <laughs> that was funny. And your household will be laid to ruins. But if you show the dream and its interpretation, you'll receive from me gifts and rewards and great honor. 
So show me the dream and its interpretation. And they answered a second time, King, listen, King, let the king tell his servants the dream and we'll show you its interpretation. They go back to that same, hey man, we got to throw us a bone here, Nebby. Like throw that out there because we'll give you the story. We just need to know the context. And the king said to me, listen, you're trying to like gain time. You're stalling because you see that the word for me is firm. If you do not make the dream known to me, there will be one sentence for you. You have agreed to speak lying, corrupt words before me until that time changes. Therefore, tell me the dream, and I shall know, and then you show me its interpretation. The Chaldeans answered the king in quotes. There is not a man on earth who can meet the king's demand, for no great and powerful king has asked such thing as any magician or enchanter or Chaldean. There's nobody that could do this dream and the interpretation, king. No one. How many of you speak English? How many of you speak Spanglish? It's a combination of English and Spanish. How many of you speak straight up Spanish? Okay. How many of you speak Swahili? Okay. Some of you do. I know you do. I've heard the words in the lobby. I'm trying to figure out the Swahili word for donut. <laughs> How many of you speak German, French, Portuguese? Oui, oui, no? What's my point? Uh, you might speak a different language. Now, hear me when I say this. You, we, me, we love to, to speak Chaldean. We absolutely love to speak Chaldean. There is no one person that could do that, Lord. We start talking like Chaldeans. There's nobody in this neighborhood could they reach this neighborhood. We start talking like Chaldeans. This whole city's going to hell in a handbag. No one could interrupt this whole thing. We start, we're speaking Chaldean. You might as well just be speaking Chaldean. There's no way that God can do this. There's no way that this is going to work out. There's no way that one person, one church, one community, one group of believers, we start speaking Chaldean. There's no one could do that. Hudson Taylor, a missionary, He's the first one that pioneered living in the place that they're reaching and also dressing like the place that they're reaching. Now, that was severely criticized at first. Now, it's commonplace to contextualize the, the, the gospel when you go to a foreign place. He arrived in China in 1854. Protestant missionaries that were there, they were just fine with dealing with the coast. They, they, they were like, there's nobody that could go into the middle of China and do this. No one could go to that spot they just started speaking Chaldean, but not Hudson Taylor. He's like, no, we're going to the middle of this country, and we're bringing the gospel there. And it's not just us, but he believed that single women were fully capable of managing these distant mission posts by themselves without the help of a man. All the ladies say amen. amen. Take it easy. But what I want you to know is 132 years later, this China Inland Mission still exists. And they don't speak Chaldean. They just speak Jesus. And we got to be careful whether we speak Chinese or English or Spanglish that we don't get caught in the trap of speaking Ch like the Chaldeans. There's no one could do this. There's no way this is going to work out. Verse 11. The thing that the king asks is difficult. No one can show to the king except the gods, little g, whose dwelling is not with flesh. Because of this, the king was angry and very furious, and he commanded that all the wise men of Babylon be destroyed. Okay, do you remember the size of Babylon, what we talked about, how big it was, like the metro area? Do you remember what we talked about, like just the size of this place? Think about all the wise men of Babylon. This is hundreds of people, thousands maybe. He declared this decree, it went out, the wise men were about to be killed, and they sought Daniel and his companions to kill them. Because remember, Daniel's a refugee, he's here in this foreign land, and he's also one of the wise one of these people that would 
protect the king. Daniel replied with prudence and and discretion to Arioch, the captain of the king's guard who had gone out to kill the wise men. He declared to Arioch, the king's captain, why is the decree of the king so urgent? Then Arioch made the matter known to Daniel. Verse 16. And Daniel went in and requested the king to appoint him at Appoint him a time that he may show the interpretation to the king. Number two. This is my second point of my message. I, you, and we, we got to live like Daniel. We have to live like Daniel. We should live like Daniel. I'll give you a couple examples here. There's going to be six of them. Six things, I think, that we see here in the rest of this that give us the equipment to live in Babylon like Daniel. Number, number one is show up. I could be that person. Can you say that out loud? No, I could be that person. One, two, three. I could be that person that God wants to use in this situation. I could be that person. Sometimes we forget that. Sometimes you think it's my job or the board's job or Steve's job. By the way, that second song we sang, Steve wrote that song. That was fun. I like doing original music. I, Katie, I got a mixtape of some of the hits I've been working on. Okay. <clears throat> I'm a DJ. But I think we got to start to admit that like, Like, I could be that person. I've sit here, I've failed, i tried, but God can still do things with me and through me. Maybe I'm that person. You want to know what 60%, I think, (coughs) of um, 60% of what really ministry is, bringing heaven to earth? Maybe, Maybe even 70 of a statistic I just made up on the fly? Do you want to know what the bulk of it is? Show up. A point of time, show up. I want to get involved. Well, let me tell you something. Like, this city is just waiting for you to get involved. You got to show up. Yes, there's structure and things that we are building. But the truth is, is like, if you show up and you talk to Pastor Naomi every week and you're like, hey, I want to serve in kids this month, just show up. 60% easy is just showing up. David, or Daniel, going before the king. He's going to be in the room when it all goes down. He's like, I could be that person that God could use in this situation. Number one, show up. Verse 17. Then Daniel went to his house and made the matter known to Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, his companions. And he told them to seek mercy from the God of heaven concerning this mystery. So Daniel and his companions may not be destroyed to the wise men of, the, of, of Babylon. So um, what, what's the other part of the math when it comes to just bringing heaven to earth? Number one is show up. Number two is what? What did Daniel do? He asked for help. Who are your companions? Who's your tribe? You know what? There's nothing wrong with having people you love to hang around with at Summit. There's nothing wrong with that, okay? Because there's 12 tribes of Israel and there's one banner. What's wrong is when these tribes get so isolated that we don't allow for other people to show up and possibly be a companion. Because we operate in judgment, not discernment. Uh, That's a whole other lesson I learned this week. But the truth is, is ask for help. You want to show up and ask for help. Because some things that God's going to call you to do are going to need other people. And not just other people, the right people to help you do it. Verse 19, the mystery was revealed to Daniel in his vision that night. And Daniel blessed the God of heaven. And Daniel answered and said... And he goes all through this, and he gets down to verse 23. To you, O God of my fathers, I give thanks and praise, for you have given me this wisdom and insight. And you've made known to me what we've asked of you. We've made known to us the king's matter. Verse 24. Therefore, Daniel went into Arioch, whom the king had appointed to destroy the wise men of Israel, the wise men of Babylon, he went in and said thus to him, do not destroy the wise men of Babylon. Bring me before the king and I'll show the king the interpretation. Number one, number, number one is what? You want to live like Daniel in Babylon? What is it? Write it down. Because if you didn't write it down, why did I write this message? 
Number one, show up. Number two, ask for help. Number three, go for it. Go for it. Like failure sometimes is not trying. Go for it. Give it a shot. Daniel says like, I'm going to go before the king. And this is what he says, verse 24. Do not destroy the wise men of Babylon. Bring me in before the king and I'll show the king the interpretation. And Arioch brought Daniel in before the king. And the king says, there's no way that this could happen. And Daniel answered to the king, I agree with you, bro. No wise man, no enchanter, no magician, no astrologer could ever show you this mystery that you have asked. You got a, you got a tough ask for us to give you the dream and the interpretation. But there is a God in heaven who reveals mysteries. And he has made known to the king Nebuchadnezzar what will be in the latter day. Number four. If you want to live like Daniel in Babylon, you got to show up, you got to ask for help, you got to go for it, and you got to trust God's ability. What did, what did Daniel say? I got it. Hold my Starbucks. What did he say? He said, there is a God in heaven that can do this. Trust God and his ability. The dream and the vision of your head as you lay there between, uh, in the bed, are, are this. That kind of rhymes. I, I got to give it to Daniel as he's writing this. He almost was a lyricist. Like, it's kind of got a good flow here. Katie, we'll talk about that in my mixtape. Your dream and the visions of your head as you lay in the bed are these. See? To you, O king, you lay there, you, these thoughts of what would be after this, and he who reveals mysteries be made known to you, what is to be. But as for me, this mystery has been revealed to me not because of any wisdom I have. Underline that in your Bible. Not because of any wisdom that I have. But in order that the interpretation may be known to the king and you will know the thoughts of your mind. Number five, after you trust God's ability, make sure you don't boast in your ability. Deflect glory to God. That's always a, just a good thing to do, but that's something that Daniel does. Daniel's got some amazing gifts that God says. He trusts in God's ability. He doesn't own it. He's not like, hey, I'm your best sorcerer or whatever. He just says, no, there's a God in heaven. And God, he says, not because of any wisdom I have. It's not my wisdom, it's his. Daniel interprets the dream, verse 31. You saw, O king. So we, now we get to the spot where Daniel is like gone through the works of all of this part of the story and he's finally in front of the king and the king is going to tear everybody limb from limb and Daniel made an appointment, he got the appointment, now he's standing in front of the king and he's going to tell the king his dream. Like this is the part where all the rubber hits the road. And then we'll save this for next week. No, I'm kidding, that's, it. that's what they do on Netflix. You know what I mean? It's like that cliffhanger. You, king, saw a great image. The image, mighty and exceeding brightness, stood before you, and its appearance was frightening. The head of the image was fine gold. Its chests were arms of silver, the middle on thighs of bronze, and its legs of iron. Its feet partly of iron, partly of clay. As you looked, a stone was cut out, not by human hands, and it struck the image on the feet of iron and clay and broke them to pieces. Then the iron, the clay, the bronze, the silver, and the gold all together were broken into pieces, and they became like chaff, like just dust in the summer threshing floors, and the wind carried them away so that not a trace of them could be found. But the stone that struck the image became a great mountain and filled the whole earth. That was the dream. Now we'll go to the interpretation. And Nebuchadnezzar is holding his big golden like, like chalice at this point, and you can just hear it drop on the floor. <laughs> clink, 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 clink. And he just goes, he got it. So Daniel tells the king, I saw a big statue. There's four parts of a statue. They're all different metals until you get to the feet. It's mixed with iron and clay. These are the four parts of a big idol. And then there's this big rock that shows up. 
not carved by human hands. Nobody hewn it out of the rock like you would normally do. It like obliterated this thing, and then it grew into a huge mountain, and it filled the entire earth. You king, the king of kings, whom the God of heaven has given the kingdom and power and the might and the glory, and who has and whose hand he has given wherever they dwell, the children of men, the beasts of the field, and the birds of heaven, making you rule over them. You are the head of gold. Side note, do you respect people in, in leadership that you don't agree with like that? I wrestle. This is unbelievable to me that this is King Nebuchadnezzar and Daniel leads with this. You're, you're the king. You're these things. You are, like he's like all of this language, the king of kings who, who, by the way, God has given you the authority, the power. See, I think sometimes we don't look at like f- figures in our uh, own place that are over us, whether it be in government or our work, or you could fill in the blank of however you have, like someone in power. I don't think we put those people always in the right position. Like we actually think at some point they have the power. Yeah, they might have the power at some level, but guess who's got power over them? That's all I'm saying. That's all I'm saying. Like God's, God's got power. He's sovereign. Relax. Another kingdom inferior shall rise after you. Now Daniel starts to interpret this whole thing. And the third kingdom of bronze will rule over the earth. There's going to be a fourth kingdom, strong as iron, because iron breaks to pieces and shatters all things. As you saw the feet and toes, particularly of clay and iron, it'll be a divided kingdom. But some of the firmness of iron shall be it. And you saw iron mixed with the soft clay, and the toes were partly iron and partly clay. So the kingdom shall be partly strong and partly brittle. And you saw the iron mixed with soft clay, and they will not mix with one another. They'll not hold together, just as iron does not mix with clay. And in those days, uh, and in the days of those kings, the God of heaven will set up a kingdom that shall never be destroyed, nor the kingdom shall be left to another people. It shall break into pieces, and all these kingdoms And bring them to an end, and it shall stand forever, just as you saw the stone that was cut from mountain by no human hand, and it broke into the pieces of iron, the bronze, the clay, the gold, and the silver. A great God has made known to the king what shall be after this. The dream is certain, and the interpretation is sure. You ever watch the Olympics? Summer Olympics? When those, like, Little girls from Russia are ripping down that, like that one runway towards that thing called the sawhorse or something. Pommel horse? They're like, they're like, you know what I'm talking about? And they hit that trampoline thing and they go like up in the air like 80 feet, right? And then they just get down and, and like from the sawhorse, pommel horse, got it. And they stick the landing and they're all like, They took maybe one step back. Like all the inertia and the force, it's like, and then, like, they don't even move. It just, and then the whole place goes bananas and they get a 10 or whatever. That's basically what Daniel did at the end of this in my mind. I just want you to know, because I know there's a lot of Bible here, and I, I just want you just to realize that where my mind goes, at the end of this whole interpretation of the dream, it is not in Scripture. But in my mind, Daniel, he gets done. He's like, it's a statue. There's four parts. There's going to be four kingdoms. God's kingdom's going to crush them all. It's going to set up. And then he's like, (laughs) and then he just like, (laughs) and then he just takes off. And then he goes, and then boom. And then he just goes right before the king. The interpretation is sure. (laughs) All right. And everybody applauses. There you go. That's what I think in my brain. That hurt my back so bad. (laughs) Oh, my gosh. All right, let me just give you a quick little overview here just so you're on one page. Everybody take a deep breath. Okay, let it in, let it out. Um, Jonathan, could you do me a favor? Or Ben, could you just run down and make sure Karen's okay with the kids? Just to to make sure she's okay because we're about 10 minutes over. And it's okay. Is it okay if I finish? Okay, if you got to go, go, but I just, I'll, we'll make sure the kids are cared for. My wife's in Sprouts. Um, 
I'm going to give her the flowers that someone gave me earlier today. Moving on. Um, so there's a statue and there's an idol and it's four parts. There are four world governing empires here that are going to rule the world, but also the Jewish people. And this is actually confirmed in history. And so the head of gold was Nebuchadnezzar. That was Babylon. The chest of arms in, in, uh, that were made out of silver was one empire with two parts, the Medos and the Persians. And then the belly and thighs of bronze, that's the Greek empire. And this is way before they're even on the scene. And they actually called the Greeks the bronze or brass-coated Greeks. The legs of iron were the Roman Empire. Now, there was two parts of the Roman Empire. There was the east and the west. So there was two legs. The feet of iron and clay. Now, we'll get to it in chapter 10 and in Revelation 17, maybe someday. It's pretty interesting. The ten toes, I would argue, I would lean on the fact that Daniel is referencing ten kings. And in Revelation chapter 17, those actually are ten horns. And it's interesting how Daniel in the book of Revelation, if you remember from week one, the book of Revelation in the New Testament is like Daniel in the Old Testament. And these ten toes or ten kings, or later, chapter seven, we'll hear about this even in more in the own book of Daniel, but in Revelation 17, they're their, their horns. This is 2,000, before, 2000 years before the Roman Empire even exists. And you can go all the way through Babylonian, the Medo, and the Persian, Greek, Rome. And then guess what the big stone is? The big stone, if you ask me, is the second coming of Christ. And this huge stone takes, and when Jesus comes back, it obliterates everything, and he sets up and it fills the earth. So some of these things, what's interesting to me about Daniel, some of these things have already happened. That's been proven in history. And some of these things are going to happen. So this, this verse 34, uh, you got to really look at that later on your own time. Because this stone that struck the image became a great mountain and filled the whole earth. This stone, not cut by human hands, the second coming of Christ. Now, in seven, uh, chapter 7 of the book of Daniel, he's got the same sort of uh, meaning but different vision. We'll get there in the next coming weeks. Instead of, um, instead of the toes, uh, excuse me, instead of the kingdoms, they're wild, ravenous beasts. It's just interesting how this will all play out. But what you need to know is chapter 2 and 7 are a picture of man's rule on earth all the way to the day of the Lord, to the second coming of Christ. Now, there are some things that will happen. We'll talk about that more as uh, ten nations will come together. The book of Daniel is very clear about this. But what I want you to really grab out of this little portion of Scripture here, even before we get to 7 and the things that are to come, the things that are here is just have a good dose of reality on the kingdoms of this earth. Okay? Have a good dose of patriotism this weekend. Let's celebrate our independence and have fish and chips. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Let, let's celebrate our independence as a country and, and let's, let's eat a brat and a steak and blow up something. That's un-American not to blow up something, right? Like, like, do those things. But can I tell you, church, look at me in the face. I, I, I want to honor our independence. I want to honor those that have fallen. You know this. You know what I've done. And while the reason I've done it, be with the military. But can I just, just have a real good, good, good helping spoonful of the kingdom of America is going to be like chaff in the wind. Like, it doesn't even come close to the kingdom of heaven that's going to fill the whole earth. Anything you've read about some history book from some ancient city, the Romans, the Medo, the Persians, all of that stuff, all of it is going to be like chaff. 
So let's celebrate our independence and let's celebrate those things, but just take a good spoonful of the reality of that, like the, the kingdom of, of America, okay, compared to the kingdom of God. One is going to last forever and the other one's going to end. And that's not a threat, that's a promise. And so rest in that. It's okay. We are a part of God's kingdom. That is a way better kingdom than the country of fill in the blank. Anyway, see kingdoms as God does, and that's just really my point, is they are beasts. See kingdoms as God does, chaff in the wind, here and there. See kingdoms as really, like have a good dose of God's perspective. Daniel is promoted. King Nebuchadnezzar fell on his face and paid homage to Daniel, commanded that an offering, an incense be offered up to him. And if you've ever seen Nacho Libre, he got all the free creams and lotions. Because Daniel was number one. And if you've never seen that, you don't get that joke. And you, but everyone that did loves me better now. Daniel, save me a piece of that corn. Okay. The king answered and said to Daniel, truly your God is the God of gods, the Lord of hosts. The king says to Daniel, truly your God is the God of gods, the Lord of hosts. This is Nebuchadnezzar saying this now. This isn't Daniel saying. This is Nebuchadnezzar saying, uh, my bad. All of these little gods, I got little gods, but you got the God. There's no way. He's a revealer of mysteries. You have been able to reveal this mystery. The king gave Daniel high honors and many great gifts and made him a ruler of all of the whole province of Babylon and a chief perfect over all the wise men of Babylon. So this guy doesn't just get promoted and lavish with gifts. He actually gets put in charge over everybody else that was going to get destroyed. Like this is a big day for Daniel. What does he do? Well, Daniel made a request before the king and he appointed Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego over the affairs of the province of Babylon, but Daniel remained in the king's court. What did Daniel do? Number six, bring people with when you're blessed. If you want to live in Babylon and function in this whole season of life, number one, stop talking like a Chaldean. Number two, we got to live like Daniel. And how we do that is by showing up, asking for help, going for it, trusting in God's ability, not boasting in yours, deflecting his glory, reflecting his glory rather, seeing the kingdoms as what they truly are and bring people with when God appoints you to your mission. Chapter three, we'll go over in the coming weeks. God, I just pray that you would continue to help us. Help us as your people. Use this as an example of how to walk through, how to walk in, and how to bring heaven to earth here in St. Paul. Give us a burden for this place you've called us to be. We've been divinely set up. We trust in your ability. God, we give you the honor and the glory. Help us see the things the way that you see them and help us bring people with, Lord, into all of this as we show up, as we go for it. In Jesus' name, amen. Have a great week, everybody. To help you apply the truth found in Scripture, we always like to ask three questions. What did you learn about God? What did you learn about yourself? And how are you going to apply what the Holy Spirit is speaking through Scripture to your life? We hope that these questions help bring clarity for you. Thank you for being a part of our online encounter. Join us in person sometime as we gather as a church on Summit Avenue. Or join us here virtually again next week. Let me just say, our city of St. Paul is absolutely amazing. I encourage you to check out all the history it has to offer. And you need to know Summit Church, this church has been a part of that history with so many amazing churches in our city. But speaking specifically about the people of Summit, well, we've been gathering here since 1932. And my hope is that this would be a rich history. It would be our forward legacy. 
history is a thing of the past, but legacy, it makes way you know, for the future. So the question I have for us is where are we going? Uh, that is a good question. Our vision is simple. It's really to see all of people and beyond living as disciples of Christ, people full of hope, uh, fully known, actively loving one another, living a spirit-led life. Our mission, it's also simple as well, to provide rhythm, location, opportunity for you to have a life-changing experience with God. Uh, you know, we all journey in our diversity to do these three things, become disciples of Jesus, deliver hope, and to champion our city. That's where we're going, and that's what we're doing. So maybe a question for you is, where are you going? You know, what are your next steps? I would encourage you to do this. Join one of our monthly expeditions. The expedition is a simple experience where you can find out more about who you are in Christ, who Summit Church is, what we do around here, and how you can maybe even you know, play a part. It's less than two hours of your time uh, for the whole month. We also feed you amazing food and even provide childcare. So the question is, where are you going? Hopefully to the expedition is my thought. We're all on a journey following Jesus, maybe together. We just might not be us without you. We'll see you at the summit.